My mom is the youngest of seven girls. Her oldest sister is 20 years older than her, and all I knew about her was that she had a history of mental health disorders that she did not treat, and that my mom had not spoken to her since she was about 10 years old. To be honest, I didn't even know this aunt existed. One day when my brother and I were about six or seven, my parents sat us down. They showed us a picture of our aunt and told us that if she tries to talk to us around the neighborhood, to immediately run to the closest house and call them right away. They said that she is dangerous and to treat her as a stranger. My brother and I were so confused because it was my mom's sister. But, okay. Fast forward about a year and my family is at my cousin's basketball game. This is the daughter of the aunt in the story. My aunt walked out in the family about 10 years before so there was no reason to think that we would see her. My brother and I begged my mom to let us get something from the snack stand so we went over and stood in line. I felt a tap on my shoulder and turned around. It was my aunt, at least it was the woman in the picture. She said, hey, I'm your aunt. I said, hi, because I did not want to be rude. She said the same thing to my brother but he didn't respond. She then said, well, this line is so long, how about I take you guys out for ice cream? I didn't know what to say to this. This was my aunt, and I really didn't want to be rude. My brother responded, Uh, no, we have to get back to our mom now. She said something along the lines of, Your mom said it's okay, you're my niece and nephew, I would never hurt you. Nope, that was it for me. I said, Sorry, uh, we gotta go. I then felt a tight grip on my wrist and was being dragged with my brother for the door. I didn't yell. I don't know why. I was a kid, I had a piercing scream, but I just froze. I heard, Let them go! Those are my kids! Someone get them! My mom was running full sprint across the court. I had never seen that kind of look in her eyes. People immediately grabbed her and got my brother and I away from her. Apparently she got charged with attempted kidnapping since my mom did press charges. We have restraining orders against her now. I'm 23. My cousins took my brother and I to get food so I don't remember much of the police part besides telling them what had happened. I only learned once I got older that the reason my parents sat my brother and I down was because at the time, my aunt was blackmailing my parents into paying all of her bills. Phone, rent, medical, etc., and sent pictures of our house and my brother and I saying she would take care of us if the money stopped. Her grabbing us at the basketball game was right when my mom and dad approached her ex-husband about the blackmailing and he is a lawyer so they were coming up with some kind of plan. I work as a secretary at my mom's office and a year ago I picked up a typical call but it wasn't typical at all. I said hi with my name, what can I help you with? She said, Well, hello. It's your aunt again. Is your mom available? I said, No, I'm sorry. Can I take a message? And she said, Just tell her I'm a free man now, and I know where she is. I know where you all are. And hung up. I told my mom. She told me it was okay and that I shouldn't worry, but... I still worry she will find me or just show up at any given moment. This happened a good few years ago. I was in my early 20s, single and living by myself. Most of my family lived about a four hour drive away from me. I was working for a small call center that provided, among other things, phone services for a 24-hour plumbing company, so they needed someone on the line at all times. My shift ran from 8pm to whenever my boss showed up to pick up the line, which was usually 6am. I worked in a building that housed several businesses of the same sort, call center work mostly, though we were the only one that had 24-hour service. Because of budget cuts, I was always the only operator on my floor. The only people in the building at night were myself and the security guy who came by to do his rounds twice a night. 
Now, because the line had to be on 24-7, I was never allowed to disconnect while I was there. I ran to and from the bathroom, ate meals sitting in front of the computer, and every once in a while sneaked a cigarette at the window within sight of the screen. Only the light above my computer was on. Everything else was turned off when everyone went away around 10pm, so I was left in this half-darkness beneath a spotlight. I had desperately needed that job to support myself, so... Despite the terrible conditions, I kept repeating that it wasn't that bad. Things were usually quiet after 10pm. I could use the extra hours on my paycheck and didn't need to get a second job. I did a lot of reading and even considered going back to school because if nothing else, the night shift would afford me plenty of time to study. So one night around 2am or so I got a call. I introduced myself as I always did. Hello, you talking to so and so? My name is Jill, uh, how may I help you? The guy on the other side repeated my name and hung up. Working phone services on the night shift, you get used to a lot of weird stuff, so I shrugged it off and went back to my book. Then he called again and asked if he was speaking to Jill. I said yes, repeated the company name, and asked how may I help you. He hangs up. The third time around, he asks if this is Jill on the phone, and I asked to whom I'm speaking. He hangs up again. The next time he calls, he's breathing hard on the phone and tells me he wants me to talk to him and he's not going to hurt me. I jot down his phone number and I start hanging up whenever his calls pop up, which was the better part of an hour. This went on for months. When he realized I was hanging up every time I saw that number, he began calling from a restricted number, meaning I never knew if it was a legit call and ended up answering. All the time this guy keeps saying he wants me to talk to him and that he's not going to hurt me. The one time I counted, I hung up on this guy over 200 times in one night. Every time he would call, I'd say the company name, and as soon as I'd hear him, I'd hang up. I complained to my boss and she did nothing. Instead, she laughed the whole thing off because this guy obviously didn't know where I was, and he was only a voice on the line and I was perfectly safe. Some time into this, I started talking to a coworker, and here's where it started getting really creepy. He never called on my days off when someone else would be covering my shift. Indeed, at one point, I changed shifts with a coworker to attend a wedding, and he didn't call that day. As time went by, I was getting pretty spooked by the whole situation and the fact my boss did zero to try and stop this. My co-workers were sympathetic and told me that if my boss did nothing I should file a complaint myself, but I'm not sure if I could since this wasn't happening on my personal number. None of them could really walk me home since I was the only operator in night shift. Everyone else was gone by the time my boss arrived and I left the office. I got a little paranoid because obviously this guy knew my schedule pretty well and even if I changed shifts, he would only call if he knew I was on the line. It had to be someone who could see me. I started doing the commute with my cell phone in hand at all times with the emergency number dialed in. Sometimes I did the whole commute on the phone with friends or relatives to keep calm. Since it's illegal to carry pepper spray here, at one point I considered walking around with a box cutter in my purse. That's how afraid I was. One day before my shift started, I was at the entrance of the building smoking a cigarette before going up and I see the security guard come by. Same fellow who usually did the night shift, this huge guy. I didn't really know him, never spoke much to him, only said good evening and goodbye when I went by his desk and whenever he came to my floor to do his rounds. I usually kept to myself and never really made small talk or anything, just greeted him out of politeness and he greeted back. He asked for a light so I gave him my lighter, he told me he'd been fired and was going home, and he went on to tell me he always got the impression I was afraid of him since I was never friendly or welcoming. Exact words. Then he told me he was never going to hurt me, and just walked away. I lost every drop of blood I had in me. I went inside to tell my boss the whole thing and discovered the guy got fired for harassing women and other floors, going as far as trying to corner someone in one of the elevators. The complaints piled up and he lost his job. Most of the time his shifts matched mine so 
He would see me come in at 8pm and left before I did. I asked my boss for that phone number again, to come forward on this guy and ask the security company if that was his number. She told me she threw it away. When I told her the whole story, she found it cute, exact word. Then she asked me if I was sure it was him, because a voice on the phone is different and maybe you got it wrong, exact words. Quality Assurance told us time and again that our every call was recorded, so I demanded recordings. That's when I found out that, again, because of budget cuts and whatnot, the night shift was never recorded, so I had no evidence. Once the guy was fired, the call stopped. I didn't work there for much longer after that. This encounter happened in the summer of 2006 when I was 20 years old. I didn't get my driver's license until January of that year and driving opened up so many doors for me that I took a lot of solo trips to my friends' houses in New England and the mid-Atlantic states. I also looked young for my age and was often mistaken for a high school student in my early 20s. I was driving alone on I-78 on a random July day on my way to visit my friend in southern PA for a long weekend. Her parents were away and we had the house to ourselves and were planning on drinking and hot tubbing and watching Planet Earth. Maybe run around some cornfields at night. I was so excited and had a great drive listening to good music and it was a beautiful day for driving. Right after I crossed the border from New Jersey into Pennsylvania, I stopped at one of the first rest stops to get gas and snacks for the last part of my drive. I have tried to figure out which rest stop this was and can't identify it, but it was a gas station with a large mini-mart. Opposite the gas station was the on-ramp back to I-78 West, and parallel to the on-ramp was a dirt road which comes into play later. I was heading into the store when a man in his late 30s, early 40s approached me. He was a stocky guy, decently tall, I'm 5'1", had on a plain black tee and jeans with dark brown hair and a mustache goatee. He had come out of a black pickup truck parked a few spaces away from my car. He had a super intense gaze and immediately creeped me out. He just had a crazy energy about him. I don't really get vibes from people that often, but this was so strange. He stood too close. His gaze was crazy, direct, and focused. His word choice was strange. It immediately set off all my alarms. He asked if I was from the area despite my Connecticut license plate, where I was heading and if I knew of anything fun to do because he had plans later and time to kill beforehand. He invited me to go play mini golf or watch a movie with him. I didn't answer any of his questions, declined his invitation to hang out and told him I didn't know the area and walked away towards the store. I was blown away that he asked me to go somewhere with him. It was so random and uncomfortable. As I was walking away, he actually screamed out, You're gorgeous! And the volume and tone made my hair stand on end. It was so aggressive and inappropriate, and he started a family walking out of the store. It was so loud. I didn't turn around, but went inside. He came into the store shortly after and was staring at me, so I went to use the bathroom and stayed in there for at least ten minutes texting my friend about this creep. When I came out, he wasn't in the store anymore, so I took my time buying drinks and snacks, sour bright crawlers and trail mix being my obligatory road trip food, and went out to gas up my car. I was relieved his car was gone and started thinking about the rest of my drive and getting excited to see my friend. When I pull up to the road to get back on the highway, I hear someone persistently honking his horn and see this creep show on the dirt road parallel to the on-ramp in his trunk honking, shouting and waving at me to drive over to him. He was directly facing the gas station and had been waiting for me to pull up. I immediately freaked out and jumped on the on-ramp back onto I-78. He pulled onto the highway after me and I called my friend extremely scared. I drove so fast and probably dangerously and looking back, I'm lucky that I didn't get into an accident, but I didn't know what to do. 
He didn't follow me for that long and I think after a few exits he pulled off. My friend and I had a backup plan that if I saw this car again, she would direct me to a police station the next town over from her house instead of me going directly there and leading some freak to us. I didn't see the car again and went to my friend's, but the last hours of my drive I was extremely tense and anxious. I remember checking my mirrors regularly for this black pickup truck. It all ended well. I got to my friend's house safely and we had a nice weekend. The encounter was definitely creepy, but over the years I didn't put much thought into it. A few years ago, in 2014, I was talking with another friend who was big into serial killers and mentioned my encounter, jokingly suggesting that he was one that I had met and told her my experience. She was fascinated and wanted to Google active ones in the Pennsylvania area at the time. The first hit was Adam Leroy Lane, and he looked almost exactly like the man I met back in 2006. Obviously, it could be my mind filling in the blanks, but the basic characteristics, 40s, tall but stocky, brown hair with mustache and goatee, and the time and area all match. In my memory, he was a little bit slimmer than the pictures, and it was 2006, not 2007, when he was actually convicted of murdering women. Still, it's an odd coincidence and one I've never forgotten. This story begins when I was in fourth grade. So, I was about nine as I was a bit young for my grade. Because of me being younger than the other kids, I didn't get along with them very well. So, whenever we would go out to recess... I would make sure to bring whatever book I was reading at the time. I had my own special place I liked to sit and read. It was a little corner of the playground where barely anybody went. It was a large patch of clovers and other overgrown plants and had a large bush with a gap between it and the fence. I used to love to sit there. One day, I went over to my normal spot and sat with my back facing the bush. I had been reading for a while when... I thought I heard a rustling sound behind me. Sometimes squirrels and chipmunks would hang out in the gap between the bush and the fence, so I didn't think much of it. That was until I heard heavy breathing and something tugging on my pigtails. Surprised, I whipped my head around, thinking my hair had gotten caught on a branch or something. But instead, there was a boy. He was sitting hunched in the gap between the fence and the bush, leaning forward between the branches with his face mostly obscured by leaves and his arm outstretched, trying to grab at my hair. I screamed, bolted for the picnic table area where the supervising teachers were. I was a very shy little thing back then, so I didn't say anything. Instead, for a long time after that, I sat and read by the teachers during recess. About three quarters of the way through the school year, I made a friend who we'll call Matt. Matt was also a bit of an outcast, and when we got assigned to be in a reading group together, we became fast friends. He was nice enough, but even my nine-year-old self could tell that there was something off about him. He was way too clingy, barely ever leaving my side and constantly coming up with excuses to touch me. I, of course, didn't have any other friends then, so I ignored it. However, one day, he told me that he liked me. I had no idea how to react to this and just said nothing. He apparently took my silence as yes because he called my home phone later that night. My mom handed me the phone saying that a friend was asking to talk to me. Since my parents were watching TV downstairs, I decided to go up to my room so I wouldn't bother them. It was Matt. I could barely even say hello before he started saying some seriously weird stuff. He started saying things like, what do you want to name our kids? When we get to high school, let's run away and start a family. I bet you look really cute when you're asleep. Now, this would be creepy for anyone. But I was nine. I had no idea how to handle the situation, so I just stayed away from him. He was not happy about this, constantly glaring at me and just being all around super creepy. A year later, I was halfway through fifth grade and had a serious bully problem. That's a story for another day. 
It got so bad that my dad decided one day to not wait until the next school year and instead switch schools the following Monday. Fifth grade at my new school was great, and starting in sixth grade, my parents got me my first phone. Of course, I called up Clara, who became my friend after the Matt incident, and let her know about my new phone. A couple of more months passed, and one night, I got a call from an unknown number. Picking up the phone, I froze when I heard Matt's voice. I still vividly remember what he said. Hey baby, I miss you so much. Why do you leave me? Not even a second after he said that, I hung up, blocked his number, and called up Clara, as she was the only person at the old school who had my number. Apparently after school, he had asked to see her phone to call his mom, as he had forgotten his at home. She handed it over to him, as she was a very kind but quite gullible girl. Soon, she noticed that he was taking a while, and that he added a pen and was writing something on his arm. She yanked her phone away and he panicked, sprinting off. Looking down at her phone, she saw that he had opened my contact info. I was freaked out but felt safe as I had blocked his number. That didn't stop him though. He would call me every single week from a different phone, leaving at least 10 messages each time. Every time I would block one number, he'd somehow call from another one. When I got a new phone, the calls stopped and I forgot about it until freshman year. At my high school, there were a couple of kids from my old school and I suddenly remembered Matt. I asked one of the boys, Harry, if he knew what happened to Matt. According to Harry, he got expelled. Teachers had caught him smelling and touching girls' hair, groping female students and trying to sneak into the girls' locker room, and writing extremely explicit stuff about himself and other girls in the grade, as well as a few other things that I can't remember. The realization hit me like a semi-truck, smelling and touching girls' hair, the boy hiding in the bush when I was just in fourth grade. So I'm at a club with my then best friend. Near the end of the night, we're approached by a random guy who is alone. He has a heavy accent and tells us he just moved here from Russia. He tells us his name is Jesse. Doesn't sound like a very Russian name and I'm immediately on guard. This friend of mine has a tendency to pick up the worst guys. I'm talking like, in a room full of people, she will somehow manage to pick out the single craziest guy in there and start dating him. And being as close as we were, I always managed to get sucked into it, and this night is no exception. I pull her away from Jesse, but not before he manages to get my friend's phone number. Later, as we are in her car ready to drive home, she gets a call from Jesse. She answers, and his voice rings out on her car speaker. Can you give me a ride home? No, I immediately mouth from the passenger side. She's silent. I just live around the corner from the club. He persuades. She reluctantly agrees and hangs up. I asked her why he can't take an Uber or walk if he's that close. But it's my friend's car and she wants to be nice and give him a ride. So we pull back in front of the club and he hops in. During this short car ride, he manages to get out a sob story about how he moved here to start over with his one-year-old son. His wife back in Russia died in childbirth. My friend is eating this up. I hate him almost immediately. The next day, he's texting and calling my friend, asking her out. She at least has the sense not to want to go out with him alone, asking me to come along with the guy I was dating at the time. So we go to the beach and drink a few beers. Jesse takes his and wanders off alone. My guy joins him and I see them chatting for a while. I distinctly remember him describing Jesse later that night. I like the guy. He just seems a little lonely. I'm wondering why no one can see the red flags but me. Then again, I always did have a sense for these things. The night goes relatively smoothly as the weeks go by. The four of us hang out a couple of more times. Jesse keeps trying to invite himself over to my friend's place. I beg my friend to, if nothing else, keep her address private. Do not let him know where you live. 
Thankfully, she thinks this is a smart policy. He seems oddly fixated on going specifically to her home. As the weeks go by, he shows us pictures of his son and he even shows us a picture of his son's birth certificate, which seems a bit overcompensating. But I never meet this supposed son and have no idea where he is during all of these outings Jesse was going on with us. I asked him plenty of personal questions, trying to figure him out, and I think he knows I'm on to him. But soon enough, my friend starts dating someone else, who is an entire other story in itself, and Jesse wants to be the only guy in her life. He becomes possessive and makes her choose, him or the other guy. Unfortunately for Jesse, she chooses the other guy. He is furious. The next day, Jesse is blowing up her phone. Texts, calls, voicemails. When we finally listen to them, they are increasingly violent, full of cursing. The last voicemail reveals everything. It was all a lie. There is no son or wife. He calls us idiots. The last word he speaks say that she'd regret it, and he will make her explode. I shudder to think of it now. So she blocks him and life goes on. But due to the next boyfriend being even crazier than this one, I eventually need to take a break from this girl. We go our separate ways. And yet the nagging feeling about Jesse never goes away. Jesse often pops into my head and I get the worst eerie feeling. A while down the road, I end up catching up with her over text. Even after our falling out, she can hardly wait a few texts into reconnecting to ask me if I remember Jesse. My blood instantly turns cold. I say yes. She sends me the link to a news article. It's about a Russian man arrested for a crime while trying to flee the country. He has a very Russian name that I've never heard before. As I read the details of the crime, I'm horrified. It turns out he murdered his ex-girlfriend by shooting her five times. I look at the photo of the suspect. It's Jesse. He got life in prison after making a plea deal to avoid the death penalty. But I'm hopeful that we never see Jesse ever again. I'm a girl and I was 15 when I was in the 11th grade, 5th form, because I'd skipped a year in primary school, so I was a year younger than most of the other kids in the class. When I was in that grade, I was not exactly the most healthy or athletic person, but I genuinely enjoyed PE class and I liked to run around in the gym and play games and such. So when I had to pick courses for semester 1 of grade 11, I made sure to pick PE just like I had done for grades 9 and 10. I was a little shocked when I got to the first day of P.E. and found out that our old P.E. teacher had gone back to Canada because his work term here was over. He had been with my school for four years, so it was understandable once someone told me that he hadn't gotten fired. We meet our new P.E. teacher. He looks to be around 30-something, with light skin, blue eyes, and blonde hair that was shaved on the sides and styled but short on top. A lot of the girls immediately liked him and said he was handsome, but I didn't see it because I wasn't interested in boys or men. This PE teacher liked to take us on walks and runs, so we would leave school at lunchtime in a bus and come back as school was ending since PE was last period. One time we went to a place that was known for its howler monkeys. It was a paved path through a forest and it went up and around a hill. We started walking, PE teacher in the back. When we reached as far as we could go in the time that we had, we turned around and started going back down the trail. I was slow and not very fit, so I was in the back with my teacher. The whole way down, we were talking about what we knew about the howler monkeys and animals in general. I was an animal nerd growing up, so I had a bunch of things to talk about. I was so happy to get to talk to an adult and have them take me seriously. I know it's kind of dumb, but... I am the oldest grandchild to a very traditional Chinese grandfather, and I'm a girl, not a son like he wanted. He pushed me hard to get good grades and never really wanted to talk to me, and my parents were always working, so I just wanted a grown-up to actually listen to what I had to say. On the bus ride back, I sat in the front of the bus so we could continue talking. 
I only got more attached to him when he let me talk his ear off about whatever I was obsessed with at the time, which was usually some comic book, TV show, or movie. I think at the time it was either Transformers or Pokemon, but whatever it was, he let me actually talk about it. I didn't see anything wrong with that at the time. I was always in the back of the group during our walks, and so was he. I figured we might as well chat. He liked to touch my hair sometimes, but I was used to that because my hair was so long it was past my butt. After a few days of just walking and going places to do jogs, we played field hockey. We did it with two teams and our teacher playing as just someone who would pick teams as he played, so he was kind of like a third team all on his own. He would help the losing team score points and I don't think it was a coincidence that the losing team was mine, seeing how non-athletic I am. It was during this game that the other girls started to see something wrong with the way the teacher played. He would pat girls on their butts with his hockey stick in order to get them to jump or get startled, leaving the ball open for him to steal. The girls later were complaining that what he was doing was gross and wrong, but I said that I didn't see anything wrong with it. It took me some time to realize that he really shouldn't be doing that, the realization coming when he started to use his hand to pinch the girls' butts instead of tapping them with a hockey stick. Next thing I knew, the dude was fired. He didn't quit. He was fired. One of the girls must have told the principal or something, but I know that it wasn't me. I was actually so upset when he wasn't there anymore, and looking back on that and knowing that I felt that way makes me feel disgusting. I started taking extracurricular drama classes when I was 12. We had a small class of about 6 or so. The eldest boy in the class was about 14. I'll call him X. I never felt comfortable around X. He was much larger than me. Think of a very large boy in a leather jacket, which he always reminded us was real leather. And he was always doing a fake Russian accent and pretending to choke people in our skits. Thus, I didn't go out of my way to speak with him. He took a particular interest with me and would try to speak with me about everything that he had done since last time he saw me. I didn't like being around him. He was off-putting for some reason. I would complain to my mother all the time about how I found him creepy and she found it amusing. As the years went by and our class got larger, he would still try and talk to me quite a bit every lesson. However, things only got worse. It started when I noticed that he would follow me around the room. We did these exercises where we would do different styles of walking, such as we would run like our baby buggy had started rolling down the hill. Once I noticed he was always behind me, I would start to do crazy random patterns to try and lose him. I never did. I thought this was odd, but I found it a bit funny. I was only 13 at this point. I again would complain to my mother and she suggested that he had a crush on me. I soon noticed that he would try and sit and stand as close as possible to me. If he was already sitting down and I chose to sit somewhere else, he would stand up and move to where I was. I was starting to get really unsettled around him by this point, but I thought he would stop eventually. He only ever did small things like this and I didn't think anything was seriously wrong. Then we got to the start of last year. By this point I had a boyfriend, though I hadn't publicly said this to my drama group because why would I have? I was 16 and X was 18. My mother had started to drop me off half an hour early at drama because she had to get ready for work. I was fine with it as I had time to do some reading on my own. That was before X had realized that I was coming early on my own. X started to arrive even before I did. My mom's car would drive up and I would see him patrolling. I'm serious when I say this. He would walk up and down the street watching for my car to arrive. When he saw me, he would then walk up to the door to my drama class and hold it open, waiting for me. It filled me with dread to see this, but my mother brushed off my complaints and said he was just being nice. I would have to wait alone with X for at least another 15 minutes every week. We would sit on a bench and I made sure I sat with a wall on one side of me and my bag on the other so he couldn't touch me. By this point, I had grown quite afraid of him. 
He had a tendency to get angry and had recently yelled at a group of students for not thanking him when he held the door open for them. Then one day, he attempted to ask me out. He was all stuttery and was clearly trying to ask me something and I knew immediately what he was trying to do. I begged for someone to arrive and funnily enough my boyfriend arrived and X was interrupted. I wasn't out of the woods yet though. Due to drama exams we started to have two classes a week. I was fine with the second class as my mother did not have to work but I was still stuck seeing him. I didn't tell anyone that I thought X was trying to ask me out as I had no proof that he was and I thought people would think I was silly. The following drama lesson, he did ask me out, and I tried to gently reject him. I was slightly relieved because he just went silent before another classmate arrived. This just made things worse. He started to come really close to me in class and would shove himself in between anyone I was sitting next to. When I would talk to a friend, he would stand directly behind them, watching me, waiting for an opportunity to speak to me. I was utterly terrified. The pinnacle of this was the day of our drama exam. His exam was two hours before mine, yet he was there when I arrived for mine. Once mine was over and I went to leave, he followed right behind me. I sprinted down the road to the train station to get home and he was right behind me. I don't know how long he followed me for, but I hid in the girl's bathroom at the station for about a half hour. I worked up the courage to tell my drama teacher who subsequently called his horrified mother. His mother knew what was happening and was just about to call my drama teacher. X had told her that we were all going out for lunch when the exams were over, yet another person's mum had told her we weren't. Thus, she parked her car near the exam and waited to see what was going on. She saw me, looking hysterical, running down the road. X had already told her of my rejection. I don't know when she confronted X or what she said, or even how long X was following me before his mother stopped him. Our next drama class was three days after the exam and two days after I told my drama teacher. My teacher arranged an intervention between me, X, and his mother. I was pulled out of drama to talk to them. His mother apologized to me and thanked me for not calling the police, as he was an adult and could have been charged. I don't recall much of the conversation as I was in such a state at the time, but I do remember X calling me the most stunningly beautiful girl that he had ever met and that I was wonderful. He apparently thought that he could get me to break up with my boyfriend before the end of the term. The one sentence that has stuck with me was his mum telling me that he would apologize to my parents at the parents' evening, the last night of term where we would show off our skills to the parents, which happened to be the following week, for the grievous harm he imposed upon my family. He and his mum left. I stayed as far away from him at the parents' evening as possible. He apologized to my parents, but I did not stay to hear that, and I have not seen him since. Seventeen or so years ago, I worked IT for the large local hospital in my city. We also provided IT services to seven other smaller hospitals and towns across the whole of our county and the neighboring county. My job was to build, install, and fix computers and provide support, in person and via phone and email, to our 6,000 users. It was an incredibly stressful job, made even worse because I was the only person in the IT staff who lived in the city where the main hospital was located, so I was often on call after business hours too. When I began here, I was straight out of university and very, very young, as I had graduated high school much younger than most kids do. I was also very shy and rather anxious. While I was unquestionably geeky and awkward, I'm autistic, high-functioning autism, so my social awareness and skills are rather poor, and I find social contact of any sort intensely uncomfortable. Remember this, as it has bearing on what happened. I was still young and reasonably cute. I would never have been called beautiful, as I was plain and a little bit overweight, but I was cute. I dress in loose, baggy, masculine clothing and do not wear makeup at all, despite being female, as I have sensory problems that make fitted clothing and the oily feel and scent of cosmetics very hard to tolerate. 
not exactly a runway model. I was in my very early 20s when this happened, but my shyness and immature social skills made me seem more like a young teen than an adult. I'm also asexual, someone who does not experience sexual attraction or sexual needs, so I choose not to date. The hospital where I worked was going through some repairs and upgrades, and one of these being the replacement of the antiquated HVAC system in the main building on the hospital campus. They brought in a major company to assess the hospital's needs, choose an appropriate system, and install it. This meant that one of the representatives from that company would be present at the hospital daily. He was given an office beside that, belonging to the head of the hospital maintenance, and I was directed to get him a computer and set him up on the network. When I got to this office and began installing the computer, things started getting weird. This was the first time I had even met the man, who I will call Andrew here for the sake of my own safety and privacy. This guy was at least 20 years older than I was, rather reedy looking due to being very tall and quite thin and very average in appearance. You're a typical forgettable middle-aged man, but he would not take his eyes off of me. Being autistic, I am naturally very uncomfortable with eye contact, especially the prolonged sort, and this man was just openly staring at me as I worked. He introduced himself as Andrew X and began asking me innocent, work-related questions, but these soon morphed into very personal inquiries that had nothing to do with work, like asking where I lived, whether I had a boyfriend, that sort of thing. I told him that I lived in the same city as the hospital, but not exactly where, as I actually lived right across the road from the hospital and didn't want him knowing that. I lied and told him that I had a long-term boyfriend too. Any question that veered in that direction of dating or romance got a curt, uninviting, bald-faced lie as an answer. I was getting very uncomfortable at this point, but I didn't react as I would. Nowadays, I would tell a guy asking that sort of question that it was none of their business and inform him that he was being inappropriate and I wanted it to stop or I would complain to HR. Back then, I was very uncertain, petrified of confrontation, and afraid to make any sort of complaint about anything, so I just kept working. I ended up having to sit down at his desk to install the correct software accesses, and while I was seated, he walked up behind me. I thought, he's just watching what I'm doing to access the programs he needs. Nope. He put his hands on my shoulders and began to massage them. I froze, stiffening up. You're stiff as a board, he said as he kept kneading my shoulders, all full of knots. Yeah, well, if I hadn't already been tense and bothered by his intrusive questions, I most certainly was after he began touching me. It is very common for autistic people to deeply dislike being touched. I tried to squirm out of his grasp, afraid to tell him to stop directly as we were in a rather secluded, untraveled part of the hospital's basement and... I was afraid to make a scene and anger him. I hurried through getting everything done, told him to call our help desk if he needed any other help, and practically ran out of his office. I should have told HR right there and then, but I didn't. It was creepy, yeah, but I didn't think HR would be any help. It was so borderline, I thought, just treading the edge of inappropriate. I did tell my boss that Andrew made me uncomfortable, but my boss forgot about it nearly immediately. Fast forward a couple of weeks, I was working in the medical imaging department installing some terminals in the CT scan suite. I was visible from the hallway. Andrew passed, walking with two men from building maintenance. As soon as he saw me, he began loudly telling his companions that I was cute, pretty, sexy, smart, laying it on thick. He walked past again and again, loudly praising me and saying he wanted to date me every time he went by. The two men he was with knew me a little and I could tell that they were bothered and embarrassed by this guy's inappropriate behavior. Finally, I finished up and ran back to the safety of my own department. Another week passed and I was heading home late. I was using the underground tunnel between the main building and a smaller one used for solely administrative offices. It's a long tunnel, passing below a busy road, and I often took this route going home, as the smaller building was very close to my apartment complex. 
I heard someone call my name and turned to find Andrew hurrying to catch up to me. It was after hours and the corridor was otherwise totally empty. I did not want him finding out that I lived right beside the hospital. I turned and ran, hearing him call my name over and over again. Being younger, I was faster and I managed to find a good hiding spot inside the administrative building without him knowing where I had gone. I had hidden myself in a network hub closet behind the tall rack of networking equipment. I had locked the door behind me, thankfully as I heard him walk up that hallway trying the doorknobs of locked offices, calling my name as he proceeded. He jiggled the doorknob of the door of the hub closet as he went by. I remained there, silent and still, long after I heard his last yell. After I was sure he had gone, I snuck out and raced home. Things calmed down for a bit after that. A few months went by without me having any contact with him, though I still saw him around the halls of the hospital more often than I thought I should. I vaguely wondered if he was trying to follow me, but there was nothing conclusive enough to prove it one way or the other. Then came the scariest part. I was working in a part of the hospital that had been patients' rooms, but was being remade into offices. I had to pull network drops into these offices to allow computers to access the network. I lost track of time while I worked and the other people working there with me, the painters and the men setting up the new desks, went home without me noticing. Eventually, I was completely alone. When I happened to glance at my watch, it was almost 6.30 in the evening. I usually left at 5.30, packed up my tools and left the room where I had been working. I stepped out into the long hallway, tired and thinking about what I would make for supper. I hadn't gone very far when I heard footsteps approaching and looked up. There was Andrew, hurriedly walking towards me. I hoped that if I switched to the other side of the hallway, he'd rush on past as he did seem to be hurrying. No such luck. He veered over to me, grabbed me hard by the biceps and forced me up against a wall. He then proceeded to pin me there with his whole body while he groped my breasts hard, easily pushing away my hands as I punched and slapped, trying to get him off of me. For a thin man, he was surprisingly strong. He leaned down so that his face was close to mine and I thought in horror, Oh God, no, he's going to kiss me. So I twisted my neck and turned my face as far from his fetid breath as was possible. Instead, he growled into my ear, Normal girls like it when guys want them. Normal girls let guys date them. All the while I was yelling, no, no, no. Finally my brain got itself out of frozen mode and I became angry. I shoved him hard and once I had enough space to make the move, I kneed him hard in the groin. He doubled over, wheezing and moaning and I ran and locked myself into one of the rooms I had been working in. The doors were solid hardwood and the locks were strong, and I knew I would be safe despite him starting to pound and kick the door. Only one problem. I had no way to call for help. I didn't carry the on-call phone during the day, didn't own my own mobile phone, and back then, mobile phones were not allowed into hospitals anyway, and none of the rooms that were being renovated into offices had telephones installed yet. I was trapped and my only way to call for help would be opening the window and yelling out. Meanwhile, Andrew continued pounding and kicking the door, screaming insults and entreaties. Five minutes passed, then ten, and he was still beating and battering the door, slamming hard against it with his full weight. I began to fear that I might be trapped there for all night, with him on the other side of the door trying to break in. I don't know what finally made him give up, Maybe he heard someone approaching or something. Suddenly the yelling and banging at the door stopped completely and I was left in breathless silence. I remained there, listening at the door, trying to detect the telltale rustle of clothing or squeak of a shoe that would tell me that he was still there waiting for me to open the door. Nothing. Just sweet, lovely, safe silence. I slowly undid the lock, then inched the door open and peered out. No one. He was gone. I knew he might be hiding out of my view in another office, but I had to do something. 
I couldn't just hole up in an office for the next 14 or so hours. Knowing it was a risk, I bolted for the stairwell and raced down to my department. I felt safe there as my workspace was in the code access controlled server room and my only co-worker and I knew the combination needed to get in. Only one person was still in the department, the woman who handled the help desk calls. I began to cry the second I saw her and she frantically asked what was wrong. She held my hands as I told her what had just happened, and she was the one who convinced me to report Andrew to HR. I knew that HR would be empty at that hour, so I sent an email rather than calling. Then I went home and became a little ball of tears, worry, anxiety, and horrified nausea. I called in sick the next day. The HR staff called me at home that afternoon and reiterated all I had already told them in my email how he had been kind of inappropriate from day one and how things had escalated so horribly. The HR director asked me to come in and write out a formal complaint form, of which I did. Because Andrew didn't work directly for the hospital itself, it was difficult for HR to handle this, I guess. They did contact the company he worked for, and he was not fired or even transferred to some other client site. He was given a tiny slap on the wrist and told to never come near me or attempt to communicate with me in any way. I still had to see this guy at work nearly every day, and I felt very unsafe when my tasks took me away from my busy areas. This added to the stress of the job and I began to suffer from stress-related medical problems like migraines, depression, and anxiety. I felt very unsupported and unprotected by HR too. About 18 months after that event, I quit that job. I'm 19 years old, 18 at the time. I work at a small amusement park arcade in a semi-rural area which generally will have a good amount of people. This happened during our summer season so we were open until 9pm but we generally only have at most 10 families, around 6.30 to 7. I mostly work outside as a ride attendant so I get a lot of customer interaction from people all the time and don't usually think much of it. I had come into work at around 3pm and my day was going normally. At around 3.30 I was running one of the roller coasters which has a big box for the operator to run the ride from. These two kids show up. One looked about 8 years old and the other was about 15 or so. They seemed very sweet and very funny so I was just enthusiastically telling them the rules and just being as kind as I possibly could so they could enjoy themselves. As soon as the ride would finish, they run from the exit right back into line to go again which isn't unusual because I get the kids that do that all the time. Sometimes I'll even have kids who will do it over and over again for an hour or more. Soon enough, they stopped riding and waved me off as they ran to some other rides to have fun. At some point afterwards, one of my co-workers came up to switch positions with me and sent me off to the Tilt-A-Whirl, another ride we have. As I'm walking down, I see from a distance a man in a black shirt standing at our gem mining station. It's just a smallish water tower that constantly releases water so kids can sift through sand and get cool rocks and such. He was just holding his hand in the water so I was going to ignore him as I made my way to the ride. As I'm getting closer, he looks me up and down and asks for my name. I couldn't lie about it, obviously, since I had a name tag on, so I just told him. He then proceeds to say, Do you think I can see you later tonight? To which I respond, No. I walked away to the ride I was operating and told a co-worker about what happened. We laughed it off as if it were nothing and I sent him on his way to the ride he had to run. Not even five minutes later the guy shows up to my ride with the two kids who I let on the roller coaster I was previously running. I'm of course not looking forward to letting him on but I toughed it out since the kids were just trying to enjoy themselves. They walked up to the entrance of the ride and I asked the man if he could hold the fence door open as I scanned his wristband. The fence door opens inward and the scanner is on the opposite side. So I ask customers to hold it open so I don't block them as they try to get to the ride. He responds with, Of course, I'll do anything for you, whatever you want. 
As I scanned their wristbands, the scanners showed that they had run out of credits, so I made sure to tell them. The younger kid with him looked upset, so I told them that they could get on the ride this one time and that they could just go talk to the front counter after. I put them on and explained the rules of the ride and ran it as usual. The entire time that the ride was running, I noticed the man was staring at me. He never let his eyes off of me, so I tried my hardest to avoid his gaze. I tried not to seem alarmed because his kids were in other carts joking around and making funny faces and gestures at me, trying to make me laugh, so I just pretended I didn't notice the man. Once the ride finished, the youngest kid stood up and said he wanted to go again. I felt bad for him, and since there wasn't any people in line, I told him he could go on again. The older kid felt dizzy, so he just got off the ride while the man and younger child stayed on. I ran it again and noticed the man was still not letting his gaze off of me. Toward the end of the ride, I saw he was lifting up his lap bar, so I told him to leave it down. It acts as a second break to slow down individual carts. Later, once the ride came to a stop, I looked over at him to tell him about the front counter, only to notice that he had put his hand in his pants to make his crotch more noticeable. I was highly disturbed, of course, because I was literally not trying to be forced to look at some dude's excited face. I quickly made sure they left and just avoided looking at the man the entire time. Later, once I had no more customers, I made sure to go to my supervisor at the time. I explained to her what happened, but she didn't know what the guy looked like, just what his older son looked like. As I was telling her, she saw the older son in the parking lot leaving, so we assumed that they were gone for good at that point, and we sort of went back to normal working. I was still on edge because I was super uncomfortable, but I just talked to my coworkers to pass the time. At around 6 or so, my supervisor asked me to take cardboard down to the dumpster. I went down alone, so there weren't many people nearby. The dumpster is sort of close to some rides, so you could see what was going on from other points of the park. As I'm throwing away cardboard, I notice a figure walking down toward the dumpsters and see that it's the same guy from earlier. He had come back to the park again. I start to freak out because I didn't have a walkie-talkie on me, and there wasn't anyone nearby to do anything. He kept walking closer and closer, eyeballing me every so often as I internally start panicking and get increasingly nervous. I thought in that moment that I was going to be kidnapped and I didn't even know what to do. Thankfully, my supervisor saw him from a distance and started speed walking in my direction. She walked right past him before he could get to me and he did a double take and just stood there as if he wasn't walking toward me. She walked me back up and told me that she didn't know if that was the guy but didn't want to leave me there alone. She switched me to another ride and said she'd make sure he didn't follow me around. She had told some other coworkers about what happened and a coworker from before made sure to stay near me because the guy kept lingering at some areas looking at me and trying to be near me when he thought my guard was down. Every time my coworkers thought he was getting too close, they'd stand near me to make sure he left me alone. At some point, his youngest kid came to the ride I was operating and he stayed on until closing time came about so the guy was nearby for a lot of the time. Toward closing, I was offered a ride home from a co-worker because he didn't want me to be alone walking to the parking lot. As we go outside, we sit on the stairs with some other co-workers and notice this car that was still in the parking lot, even though at that point we had been closed for about 45 minutes. The guy was still there, with his family and everything just lingering. There were no other cars in the customer parking except for them, so... I assumed that this dude had to have some of his own family involved because he was just waiting there. I can't see any other reason he'd be there. It felt too coincidental that his family so happened to stay later than they had to. I kept nervously looking over and looking to see what he was doing and he was just staring in a direction as he just sat there while his family was doing some other stuff. Thankfully at some point they had left but I couldn't help but feel uncomfortable at the thought of if I was just completely alone when I left. I'm so glad I have some responsible and caring co-workers because if not, I have no idea what would have happened. I 
I've had my Instagram for about five years. I post pretty simple photos, ones of me, and I'm a photographer and an artist, so a good amount of pictures that I take as well. I don't have a large following on Instagram, so considering this started about four years ago, I probably had about 2,000 followers, and most of them were friends, family, or friends of friends. One day I posted a screenshot on my private Instagram of someone random viewing my story. I'm not sure what the context was, but it doesn't really matter. Soon after, a friend of mine pointed out that one of the Instagram accounts that was viewing my story had a profile picture that was a photo of my friend, so I immediately went to their account. When I went on their account, I noticed that all of the pictures were ones screenshotted from my account, and I immediately started freaking out. They went by a kind of Russianized version of my name and had around a thousand followers. I was totally baffled. This account didn't last that long and was receiving probably more activity than my own account was. I was confused, but I also knew that that was what happened when you have a public Instagram and some catfish isn't going to ruin my life, so I reported the account and moved on. Soon after, I started getting messages from random Instagram accounts that all seemed to be coming from Russia. They would send me messages and screenshots of different accounts. They also seemed to be Russian, of people pretending to be me. I started to panic more as I knew that not only was it not just one person, but that many people knew about it and genuinely thought that I was a completely different person than I was. I kept reporting these accounts and they would mysteriously delete and then show up under new names. But at this point, my Instagram account was blocked by pretty much all of my catfish accounts. I logged into my friend's Instagram and noticed tagged photos of this catfish of me. Drawings. Many drawings. People drawing me who they totally thought was some random Russian girl. There was a Twitter account, a YouTube account, a VK, a Russian-based social media account, a Facebook account, all under this fake name and using photos of me. I finally got a lot of the accounts deleted and felt relieved. Then, probably about six months later, I got another message on Instagram from some other random Russian account sending me to yet another fake profile pretending to be me. The first thing that stuck out to me was the fact that they had a photo of my mom and I from when I was a baby. A photo that was only available on my mom's Facebook, which is not public. I panicked, reported the account, and told all my friends to do the same. Then I got curious and started wondering who these people were that were finding and sending these accounts. I went deep back into my Instagram DMs and found that those accounts were now also catfishes of me. I don't know what part of me thought that it would be a good idea to message them, but I did. I ended up having a very odd conversation with them where they told me that they used photos of me because I look like them and they were self-conscious. They even said that they show their family photos of me and pretend it's them. One day, I tried to log into my Instagram and it said that someone in Russia had made numerous attempts to change my password. It was insane. Basically, I'll save the time and effort and say that this went on for another three years, happening randomly about every six months. Finally, there was one account made using my own name. I was so furious and had completely given up. A few of my friends messaged them and told them to delete their account. They DM'd me and apologized in broken English and then decided that they were going to turn the account into a fan page. Again, weird. I even got to a point where I was considering calling up the producers of Catfish or something, literally anything. The fan page was running for probably three months, but it seems to me that they have deleted it. I still got weird messages from Russian accounts that seem too similar to the others, but I don't feel as freaked out by it. This whole situation sucks because I was never directly threatened or put in a situation in which I felt like my life was in serious danger so I couldn't go to the police. But there were definitely times when I felt like I was being watched too closely for someone who was not famous or anything near it. Not really sure how to end this because it probably never will end, but I have a Russian catfish stalker. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Be sure to subscribe and click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. 
If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r Let's Read Official, and give and receive feedback from the community, and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video. And join my Discord to interact with me and other listeners directly. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations for just $1 a month on Patreon, and maybe even pick up some Let's Read merch on Spreadshirt. Links in the bio. Thanks so much, friends, and always remember to paddle your cat out.